Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, welcome to the seventh lecture of this series on great experiments in psychology. In today's lecture, we are going to discuss one of the major studies on memory. We have talked about um, Ebbinghaus and his uh, research uh, on memory and his uh, pioneering research on learning and memory in the previous class. Today's class, we are going to discuss about the applications of memory research. Is memory faulty? is a memory always correct? How do we process material and how do we store it? And later on, how do we retrieve that material? Ebbinghaus showed it in the laboratory situation. Here in today's class, we are going to discuss about the applications and is Im its implications in different aspects of society. So, to start off with, today's lecture is going to be the reconstruction of an automobile destruction. It is an example of the interaction between language and memory. This study is famous on its own account. This was done by Elizabeth uh, Lofter, uh, Loftus and uh, she studied uh, memory and it is how, why do people make errors while reporting something. And to say it in her own words, the research that I and many other psychological scientists have done has taught us about the malleability of human memory. Thousands of experiments conducted over the last century reveal this truth that despite the value of human memory for allowing us to manage our lives effectively, it is not very hard to get people to remember things that never happened. So, is not this interesting? So, I chose this study of Loftus uh, to as one of the great experiments and great researchers in psychology because we have been talking about memory. So, now we will discuss about something that where people store memories or people recall memories of events that have never happened. Now, do you think that is possible? It is possible. I will just show you how. So, basically uh, the background of Loftus study began in 1973 primarily when the Devlin committee was set up to look at 2000 legal cases in England and Wales that had required identification lineups. So, basically where an individual for conviction had to be identified and primarily this is uh, as you can well understand the memory applications of this memory research is on law primarily. So, in 45 percent of the cases it was seen that the suspects were picked out and 82 percent of them were convicted. Of the 347 cases in which prosecution occurred when eyewitness testimony was the only evidence against the def defendant and 74 percent of them were convicted. So, just imagine that 74 percent of these 347 cases were prosecuted only on one individual's eyewitness testimony. So, that is where there is just one individual um, vouching that he or she had seen this um, uh, person, this prosecuted uh, on in a particular place or doing so committing some action. So, this indicates the overwhelming weight given to eyewitness testimony and this has been quoted by Badele in 1999. So, uh, as you can see that there were several uh, cases that were lining up in the legal cells where uh, the um, uh, in the law was actually banking upon one person's uh, statement of um, e evidence and that would be eyewitness testimony. So, the reconstructive nature of memory led some researchers to question the eyewitness testimony. So, what is reconstruction? Reconstruction is something that has happened 
and then the individual is asked to remember the events that had happened and recall it and uh, again um, respond or uh, state it in front of another uh, an audience at a different time period. So, uh, say suppose um, think about um, yourself travelling in a public transport say um, two days back and uh, if you try to recall how uh, was the person who was sitting beside you look like. Try and reconstruct that and see how much of it you can remember actually. Most of the information that we do not remember, we try and fill in. We will see how that was done and this was shown by Loftus. So, reconstructive memory was uh, this was this theory was put forth by Bartlett uh, another researcher way back in 1932 and Bartlett used serial reproduction in which one person reproduces some material and um, a second person has to reproduce the first reproduction and the third person reproduces the same thing and it goes on and on from one person to the other. So, basically uh, you may have you may be familiar with a game called Chinese whisper where you whisper uh, a sentence um, to somebody and or say a paragraph to somebody and it moves from one individual to the other. And finally, when it comes back to you after uh, completing a full circle, you will see that it was way different from what you had said at the in the first place. Now, Bartlett used this method um, with uh, one very famous North American uh, folk tale called the war of ghosts. So, the war of ghosts goes like this it is a huge uh, it is a long story about uh, two men who are in the woods and who goes to the war. I will not go through this story you can see it later on on the PPT. And um, on reproduction when it moved from one individual to the other and on reproduction it was seen that the story had become shorter and it had become more conven conventional. So, uh, the additional parts were actually removed. And uh, this by the way this story is a North, in North American folk tale, but it was uh, actually the experiment was carried out with English people. So, they were not familiar with the story and uh, so what they did was they remember they shortened the form of it remember the primary points and specially the conventional points and that made the story more coherent. So, it was in put in simple terms. And Bartlett concluded from his findings that the interpretation plays a major role in remembering of stories and past events. So, it is not the story per se that is remembered as per every word. So, or I should say that the words of the story are not remembered, but the story uh, the context of the story that was being reproduced. So, the content or specific content of the story was not being reproduced, but the context. So, learning and remembering are both active processes trying to make the past more logical, coherent and generally sensible. So, that is why you were uh, the individuals were uh, trimming down the additional portions, the cliches, the other extra um, uh, non coherent parts were being trimmed down and was it was made being made into short and precise. The inferences or deductions are generally made about what could and what should have happened. So, what we do is we reconstruct the past by trying to fit it into our existing understanding of the world through our schemas. So, our schemas is our basic ways of our basic patterns of seeing the world and we try and fit a, a uh, uh, while reconstructing, re reconstructing the past, we try and fit it with our existing schema of things. And this was actually studied uh, again by Allport. And what Allport did was he showed a picture of a black man uh, dressed in good clothes and a white man um, dressed in uh, shattered, tattered clothes uh, with um, 
knife in hand, uh, they were uh, standing next to each other in uh, on a train. There were other people in the train and this photograph was uh, shown for a few seconds to uh, several individuals and later on it was seen that the mm, uh, gradually the mm, uh, image was uh, reconstructed as when people reported what they saw, it changed the knife shifted from the hand of the white man to the black man and the black man was supposedly wearing tattered clothes as compared to the white man. So, white man was well dressed. So, now this uh, study when it was conducted with white men as you can well understand uh, because the idea this was conducted way back in the early 20th century and as you can understand at that point in time uh, black men were associated with violence and poverty and so, uh, it was more uh, that um, uh, he would be the one holding the knife and who would be wearing the tattered clothes. So, what are the individuals doing in this case? Are they trying to lie and are they trying to just impose? No. Uh, on the other hand, they are reconstructing their memory, they are reconstructing the events of the imagery that they had seen as per their schema as their pattern of things and they would fit it to the reconstruction would fit with their schema and that is how they would remember the associations. So, uh, Bartlett and of course, Aristotle's theory, um, uh, Alport's uh, experiment both had uh, an influence on Loftus and um, he uh, she invented the uh, eyewitness testimony. So, Loftus was a pioneer and still is in the field of uh, eyewitness testimony research and she uh, which represents an application of cognitive psychology in the real world social phenomena. So, the evidence given by law witnesses in court cases is highly unreliable as per Loftus uh, and she said that this is explained largely by the kind of misleading questions that witnesses are asked. So, the lawyers are skilled in asking such questions deliberately as are the police when interrogating suspects and witnesses to a crime or accident. So, Loftus showed that when an individual is given a cue, then the memory also reconstructs an event as per that cue. You know one very important uh, whenever I am talking about eyewitness testimony or when I am teaching about Loftus study, uh, one very famous film that comes to my mind is uh, 12 Angry Men. This was a film made in 1957 which talks about a jury um, whose um, who decide on the fate of a young man who has been convicted of murdering his father. So, I think you should see this movie and you will see how eyewitness testimony can falter and uh, how um, you know what are the what could be the influences on an individual uh, to uh, give a wrong testimony. It is not always that a false testimony. So, it is not that the person is trying to lie. So, you could probably watch this movie 12 angry men, it is really interesting and very relevant for this study. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Loftus's basic uh, procedure or paradigm has been to manipulate the questions that the participants uh, are asked about a film or slide or s of an automobile accident or a stage crime in order to see how these can affect what they remember of the incident. So, what Loftus was trying to do here was trying to play the lawyer or the policeman and provide a cue that was actually not present and see that how the witnesses would respond to it. So, this procedure is an attempt to stimulate real world situations in which witnesses are asked often very misleading questions by police and lawyers. So, the hypothesis was that the, the, to investigate the influence of the wording of the question used to tap participants estimates of speed. So, how fast two cars are involved in an accident while traveling and on the actual speed estimate. So, Loftus and Palmer defined a leading question that by the I, that either uh, its form or content suggests to the witness what answer is desired or leads him or her to the desired answer. So, that is providing a cue without directly telling that individual about the cue. So, let us see what the experiments were like.
So, in experiment 1, um, 45 students were divided into 5 groups. So, that would be 9 students in each group and the experimental condition was that they watched 7 different films of traffic accidents between 5 and 30 seconds each. And following each film, the participants were asked a series of specific questions about the accident and the critical question being the one about the speed at which the cars were traveling. So, uh, what methodology was uh, followed was that after watching the film, uh, follow, uh, the subjects received a questionnaire asking them first to give an account of the accident you have just seen and then to answer a series of specific questions. And what did that uh, have? Loftus and Palmer manipulated the verb used to refer how the cars touched. So, some of the questions as you know as uh, Loftus stated. So, uh, what would be just the manipulation of the verb. So, uh, it, it, it goes like this that about how fast were the cars going when they. So, to one group it was when they hit, when they contacted, when they bumped, collided or smashed. So, the five groups got five different verbs and uh, what do you think? would be the response. It is a very interesting response, wait let me see. So, they were asked about the speed estimates. So, people who got uh, the question that how fast was the car, let us get back to this, how fast were the cars going when they smashed, you will see that the mean speed estimate was 40.5. When the verb was how far were they uh, was the speed, uh, how fast was the speed when they collided it was 39, bumped would be 38.1, hit 34 and contacted 31. So, what do you think actually is influencing the estimated speed or the response of the speed? of I mean you know as given by the individuals by the participants or the subjects. It is basically on the based on the cue word that the examiner and that the experimenter was providing and the expert the cue word being smashed or hit or bumped or collided or contacted. So, just by that word they would estimate they would they would reconstruct the image or, or reconstruct that incident as they had seen earlier on the video and uh, like uh, just based on that q word they would estimate the speed and say. So, as you can see that just based on one word the whole um, imagery is reconstrued. Now, in experiment 2 what Loftus did was she took 150 students and divided them into 3 groups and they watched a film of a car accident lasting just 4 seconds. So, earlier it was between 5 and 30 seconds and here it was just uh, 4 seconds and they were shown just one film. So, at the end of each film the subjects received a questionnaire asking them to describe the accident in their own words and then to answer a series of questions about the accident. And what was the question asked here? the subject about the speed of the vehicles again about how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other. The next one was again when they hit and the third group this is the control group where they were not told anything about the speed. So, so they were not asked anything about the speed. So, there are two groups who were asked one was smashed the other was, uh, so the question was how fast were the cars going when they when they smashed against each other and the second one was when they were hit, when they hit against each other and there was a control group who were not asked. A week later the participants had to come back and without the seeing the film again they were asked another question. So, did you see any broken glass and they were supposed to answer by a yes or no. So, um, this question was embedded in a list totaling of 10 questions. So, there were several other questions and this was one of the questions and the question appeared randomly. So, to um, 
um, to rule out the serial position of the question. It was appearing randomly in um, questionnaire with other 9 questions. And strangely, uh, you know, what, uh, can, you, can you guess what the answers would be? Incidentally, there was no broken glass in the real incident. The video that they had seen one week earlier, there was no broken glass. But when the results were seen, the individuals who had uh, first uh, been asked uh, the week before, who had been asked that uh, what was the speed when they smashed, those individuals responded as seeing broken glass. So, 16 had seen, though 34 had not seen it. The, for the hit condition, there were 7 and for the control condition, there were 6. And the more interesting thing is the um, probability of saying yes. So, the probability of saying yes to the broken glass question was significantly greater when the verb smashed was used with the group for whom the verb smashed was used one week ago and as compared to the group where hit was used. So, individuals who had uh, again you know both these experiments show that individuals who had uh, this idea that uh, with the Q word that one car had smashed against the other, they the probability of them that group reporting that there was broken glass you know obviously went with the imagery of two cars crashing against each other or smashing against each other. So, they reconstructed the event by saying that yes, there was broken glass. So, most of them saw it as compared to the group where they said that it was they hit against each other. And as you will see from the results that you know a very small number of people from the control group thought they had seen broken glass. Most of them did not see any broken glass, because they were not given any cue about whether the, uh, the, the accident was a smash or a hit. So, as in whether it, the, about the intensity of the impact. So, how uh, grievous was the impact. Now, um, what were the conclusions drawn from this these experiments? The results of experiment 1 and 2 indicate that the form of a question, how you are actually asking the question can markedly and systematically affect a witness answer to the question. So, this could be a result of either the response bias factors. So, as we decided on which one is more grievous or which one is more intense, the word smashed or hit and that changed the participant's memory representation of the accident, the way he or she is uh, seeing the seriousness of the accident. And experiment 2 was designed to test this second interpretation. So, that is whether uh, they saw it as more serious and when they saw it as more serious, they would obviously see broken glass also, because that would also uh, be a result of the impact. And it showed actually that is how it was and several individuals remembered other details broken glass that did not actually occur, but which were consistent with the accident occurring with any accident occurring at high speed. So, think about this that when an individual is asked a question mm, about something that has happened earlier. So, we in, in the previous class we saw that uh, by Ebbinghaus that we forget generally a um, uh, large part of it immediately within the first 20 minutes. So, how can an individual's memory be trusted after days? In, uh, when, uh, when he has to reproduce that event uh, in front of uh, the law abiders. So, uh, generally what happens is the part that is actually forgotten is reconstructed and reconstructed as per our own schema and we fit in things. So, we compensate. So, so here several subsequent research followed following uh, you know uh, Loftus and Palmer's research and it was seen that there are four different kinds of memory distortions. So, one 
that, cons that was concerned with the effect of leading questions that is one we saw. The other is those in which new items are inserted by suggestion into a previously observed scene. So, um, again you know so the idea of a broken glass several other experiments were conducting uh, conducted uh, relating to this and those which manipulate details of an object that appeared in the previous scene. So, uh, there was various studies relating to changing the type of object or changing the presence of an object that appeared in a scene. And along with this, these three types are to do with distorting a memory or at least the report of an event where which participants actually witnessed. So, there was some event and that was remembered with uh, compensations. So, uh, maybe a part of it was misconstrued, part of it was compensated on. So, there were some other new uh, information added or subtracted. But another form of uh, memory distortion studies uh, was taken upon uh, that began with uh, this Loftus Palmer's research was uh, the false memories. So, where uh, it was seen Gary et al studied it in 1994 and he showed that uh, there was uh, there are events that are remembered supposedly that have supposedly happened what which, which actually did not happen in happen in the participants past. So, um, do you believe in this? I will just relate a study of a false memory. Uh, which Gary et al in 1994 uh, stated. So, 14 year old Chris was convinced by his older brother Jim that he had been lost in a shopping mall as a small child. Chris was given summaries of childhood events, three actual events and the false shopping mall incident and asked to write about each one. Jim repeatedly provided Chris that is the um, younger brother with false details about the shopping mall. Two weeks later, Chris could remember the details such as the appearance of the elderly man who rescued him. And when Chris was debriefed that is told about the experiment later, he was utterly dismayed. So, he had started believing this. You know in real life also you will get to see this uh, very frequently. Uh, you know if you start telling yourself something which actually has not happened and if you start believing in it, uh, you, know, you know if you keep telling yourself several times then many many times we start believing in it. So, uh, you know uh, it sometimes starts like this you might have come across people who say like, um, I, I you know I have a feeling that uh, he is going to be very uh, insulting to me. And then with time the moment uh, it, it such happens that the individual starts believing that this uh, the other individual was act had actually insulted him. And there have been several studies relating to this uh, which have shown uh, the false memory syndrome. And Loftus refers to a small number of studies involving large group of participants all showing that it is possible to implant false memories. And this has this uh, false memories research has also influenced the way rumors are spread and especially in um, in a point of crisis at a point of crisis social crisis and during a natural calamity uh, several false memories are uh, reconstructed in this way and remembered in this way and recalled this way. So, uh, the, uh, a large number of memory studies started with uh, Loftus's study in 1975. So, uh, again we will end this uh, research this uh, this discussion today's discussion with uh, in Loftus's own words. So, communicating what we have learned to the broader public will go a long way towards minimizing the damage that false memories can cause. If there is one lesson to be learned from our findings it is this just because a memory is expressed with confidence just because it contains detail just because it is expressed with emotion does not mean it really happened. We cannot yet reliably discriminate true memories from false ones, we still need independent corroboration. Advances in neuroimaging and other techniques may one day aid in this endeavor. 
But in the meantime, we as a society would do well to continually keep in mind that memory, like liberty, is fragile. Thank you.